In this module, you will be studying, be learning about key or concepts and major constructs of Gestalt counseling, understand the counseling process involved in Gestalt practice, examine the techniques, procedures and intervention strategies adopted by the Gestalt counselor, evaluate the contributions of Gestalt paradigm in counseling. Counseling. Fritz Perls is generally considered the foremost practitioner of Gestalt counseling and psychotherapy. However, his method was influenced by the Gestalt psychologists who preceded him such as Max Verdemir, Wolfgang Kohler and Kurt Kafka, Sander Ferencisi. The word Gestalt is a German term used to define a unique patterning in which parts are integrated into the perceptual whole. Gestalt psychology is concerned with perception and cognition, whereas Gestalt therapy focuses on personality, psychopathology and psychotherapy. Gestalt counselors and psychotherapists engage in whole organism, that is the person, and operate from the perspective that human beings have the capacity and strength to grow, to develop and to become the persons they are meant to be. Practitioners make a basic assumption that individuals can cope with their life problems, especially if they are fully aware of what is happening in and around them. Clients are directed to move from talking about experience to directly experiencing what they are focusing on at any given moment in counseling. Clients are seen as having the ability to respond to their environment appropriately and flexibly. Most Gestalt counselors would agree that the particular goal of Gestalt therapy is the phenomenological exploration of the individual rather than reconditioning of behavior or interpretation of the unconscious. The process of change in Gestalt counseling consists of identifying and working through a variety of blocks or interferences that prevent the client from achieving a balance. Specific interventions are the concrete behaviors of experimentation that emerge from the cooperation that exists between the client and the practitioner. They are labeled experiments rather than exercises because they are procedures aimed at discovery. Generally, just all therapy lacks dimension usually associated with brief interventions such as a quantifiable goal. The focus is not facilitating behavioral changes in the client, but on helping the client to develop insight and interpersonal awareness. Gestalt therapy is holistic. It does not break a person down into separate variables, so it is difficult to classify clients in the manner required by the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of DS Mental Disorders. Gestaltists view symptoms as an individual's creative adjustment to a difficult situation in his or her life. Gestalt theory advocates that the individual cannot be understood in isolation but must be understood within his or her social and historical context and within the uniqueness of his or her field. The basic goal of Gestalt therapy is attaining awareness and with it greater choice. Awareness includes knowing the environment, knowing oneself, accepting oneself and being able to make contact. Increased and enriched awareness by itself is seen as curative. With awareness, clients have the capacity to face and accept denied parts as well as to fully experience their subjectivity. They can become unified and whole. When clients stay with their awareness, important unfinished business will always emerge so that it can be dealt with in counseling. The Gestalt approach helps clients note their own awareness process so that they can be responsible and can selectively and discriminatingly make choices. Awareness emerges within the context of a genuine meeting between the client and counselor or within the context of 
I thou relating. The existential view is that individuals are continually engaged in a process of remaking and discovering themselves. Humans do not have a static identity but discover new facets of their being as they face new challenges. Gestalt counseling is basically an existential encounter out of which clients tend to move in certain directions. Through a creative involvement in Gestalt process, Zinker expect clients will move toward increased awareness of themselves, gradually assume ownership of their experience as opposed to making others responsible for what they are thinking, feeling and doing. Develop skills and acquire values that will allow them to satisfy their needs without violating the rights of others. Become more aware of all of their senses. Learn to accept responsibility for what they do including accepting the consequences of their actions. Move from outside support toward increasing internal support. Beiser's paradoxical theory of change contends that when individuals face and fully become what they are rather than what they think they should be, individuals open rich possibilities for change. Through engagement with clients, Gestalt counselors assist clients in developing their own awareness and experiencing how they are in the present moment. According to Pearls, Hefferlein and Goodman, the counselor's job is to invite clients into an active partnership where they can learn about themselves by adopting an experimental attitude toward life in which they try out new behaviors and notice what happens. Gestalt counselors notice what is in both the foreground and the background. The counselor's job is to encourage clients to attend to their sensory awareness in the present moment. According to Yontef, although the counselor functions as a guide and a catalyst, presents experiments and shares observations, the basic work of counseling is done by the client. Yontef stresses that the counselor's job is to create a climate in which clients are likely to try out new ways of being. Gestalt counselors do not force change on clients through confrontation. Instead, they work within a context of I-Thou dialogue in a here and now framework. An important function of Gestalt counselors is paying attention to clients' body language. These nonverbal cues provide rich information as they often represent feelings of which the client is unaware. The counselor needs to be alert for gaps in attention and awareness and for incongruities between verbalizations and what clients are doing with their bodies. In addition, to calling attention to clients' nonverbal language, the Gestalt counselor places emphasis on the relationship between language patterns and personality. Clients' speech patterns are often an expression of their feelings, thoughts, and attitudes. The Gestalt approach focuses on overt speaking habits as a way to increase clients' awareness of themselves, especially by asking them to notice whether their words 
are congruent with what they are experiencing or instead are distancing them from their emotions. The Gestalt counselor gently challenges clients by interventions that help them become aware of the effects of their language patterns. Language can both describe and conceal. By focusing on language, clients are able to increase their awareness of what they are experiencing in the present moment and of how they are avoiding coming into contact with this here and now experience. Here are some examples of the aspects of language that Gestalt counselors might focus on. It talk. When clients say it instead of I, they are using depersonalizing language. The counselor may ask them to substitute personal pronouns for impersonal ones so that they will assume an increased sense of responsibility. For example, a client says, it is difficult to make friends. She could be asked to restate this by making an I statement. I have trouble making friends. You talk. Global and impersonal language tends to keep the person hidden. It takes some degree of art to get clients to describe what is going on within them in a manner that reveals their experience. The counselor often points out generalized uses of you and asks the client to substitute I when this is what is meant. When a client says, you feel sort of hurt when people don't accept you. He can be asked to look at how he is distancing himself from intense feelings by using a generalized you. Again, the client can be encouraged to change this impersonal you into an I statement, such as, I feel hurt when I am not accepted. Questions. Questions have a tendency to keep the questioner hidden, safe, and unknown. Gestalt counselors often ask clients to change their questions into statements. In making personal statements, clients begin to assume responsibility for what they say. They may become aware of how they are keeping themselves mysterious through a barrage of questions and how this serves to prevent them from making declarations that express themselves. Language that denies power. Some clients have a tendency to deny their personal power by adding qualifiers or disclaimers to their statements. The counselor may also point out to clients how certain qualifiers subtract from their effectiveness. Experimenting with omitting qualifiers such as maybe, perhaps, sort of, I guess, possibly, and I suppose can help clients change ambivalent messages into clear and direct statements. Likewise, when clients say, I can't, they are really implying, I won't. Asking clients to substitute won't for can't often assists them in owning and accepting their power by taking responsibility for their decisions. Other words that deny power are the shoulds and oughts that some people habitually use. By changing these I shoulds to I choose to or I want to, 
clients begin to take active steps to reduce the feeling of being driven and not in control of their lives. The counselor must be careful in intervening so that clients do not feel that everything they say is subject to scrutiny. Rather than fostering a morbid kind of introspection, the counselor hopes to foster awareness of what is really being expressed through words. Listening to clients' metaphors. In his workshops, Irv Polster emphasizes the importance of a counselor learning how to listen to the metaphors of clients. By turning into metaphors, the counselor gets rich clues to clients' internal struggles. Examples of metaphors that can be amplified include client statements such as It's hard for me to spill my guts in here. At times, I feel that I don't have a leg to stand on. Beneath the metaphors may lie a suppressed internal dialogue that represents critical unfinished business or reactions to a present interaction. The art of therapy consists of translating the meaning of these metaphors into manifest content so that they can be dealt with in counseling. Listening for language that uncovers a story. Polster also teaches the value of what he calls fleshing out a flash. He reports that clients often use language that is elusive yet gives significant clues to a story that illustrates their life struggles. Effective counselors learn to pick out a small part of what someone says and then to focus on and develop this element. Clients are likely to slide over pregnant phrases but the alert counselor can ask questions that will help them flush out their storyline. It is essential for counselors to pay attention to what is fascinating about the person who is sitting before them and get that person to tell a story. The general orientation of gestalt counseling is toward dialogue. Whereas Fritz Perls would have said that clients must be confronted about how they avoid accepting responsibility, the dialogic attitude carried into gestalt therapy originally by Laura Pearls, creates the ground for a meeting place between client and counselor. Other issues that can become the focal point of counseling include the client-counselor relationship and the similarities in the ways clients relate to the counselor and to others in their environment. Clients in gestalt counseling are active participants who make their own interpretations and meanings. It is they who increase awareness and decide what they will or will not do with their personal meaning. Miriam Polster describes a three-stage integration sequence that characterizes client growth in counseling. The first part of this sequence consists of discovery. Clients are likely to reach a new realization about themselves or to acquire a novel view of an old situation. Or they may take a new look at some significant person in their lives. Such discoveries often come as a surprise to them. The second stage of the integration sequence is accommodation, which involves clients recognizing that they have a choice. Clients begin by trying out new behaviors in the supportive environment of the therapy office, and then they expand their awareness of the world. Making new choices 
is often done awkwardly, but with support, clients can gain skill in coping with difficult situations. Clients are likely to carry out homework assignments that are aimed at achieving success. If an out-of-office experiment does not go well, the client and counselor can explore what went wrong and why. The discussion can move forward into new action by asking what can be done differently next time. The third stage of the integration sequence is assimilation, which involves clients learning how to influence their environment. At this phase, clients feel capable of dealing with the surprises they encounter in everyday living. They are now beginning to do more than passively accept the environment. Behavior at this stage may include taking a stand on a critical issue. Improvisation is the confidence that comes from knowledge and skills. Clients are able to make choices that will result in getting what they want. The counselor points out that something has been accomplished and acknowledges the changes that have taken place within the client. At this phase, clients have learned what they can do to maximize their chances of getting what is needed from the environment. Gestalt practice involves a person-to-person -person relationship between counselor and client. Counselors are responsible for the quality of their presence, for knowing themselves and the client, and for remaining open to the client. They are also responsible for establishing and maintaining a therapeutic atmosphere that will foster a spirit of work on the client's part. The counselor's experiences, awareness and perceptions provide the background of the counseling process and the client's awareness and reactions constitute the foreground. It is important that counselors allow themselves to be affected by their clients and that they actively share their own present perceptions and experiences as they encounter clients in the here and now. Gestalt counselors not only allow their clients to be who they are, but also remain themselves and do not get lost in a role. They are willing to express their reactions and observations. They share their personal experience and stories in relevant and appropriate ways, and they do not manipulate clients. Further, they give feedback that allows clients to develop an awareness of what they are actually doing. The counselor must encounter clients with honest and immediate reactions and explore with them their fears, catastrophic expectations, blockages and resistances. A number of writers have given central importance to the I-Tao relationship and the quality of the counselor's presence as opposed to technical skills. They warn of the dangers of becoming technique bound and losing sight of their own being as they engage the client. The counselor's attitudes and behavior and the relationship that is established are what really count. These writers point out that current gestalt counseling has moved beyond earlier therapeutic practices. Many contemporary counselors place increasing emphasis on factors such as presence, authentic dialogue, gentleness, more direct self-expression by the counselor, decreased use of stereotypic exercises, and greater trust in the client's experiencing. Polster and Polster emphasize the importance of counselor knowing themselves and being therapeutic instruments. Like artists who need to be in touch 
with what they are painting, counselors are artistic participants in the creation of new life. Polsters implore counselors to use their own experiences as essential ingredients in the counseling process. According to them, counselors are more than mere responders or catalysts. If they are to function effectively, counselors must be in tune with both their clients and themselves. Counseling is a two-way engagement that changes both the client and the counselor. If counselors are not sensitively tuned to their own qualities of tenderness, toughness and compassion and to their reactions to the client, they become technicians. If they are to function effectively, counselors must be in tune with both their clients and themselves. Counseling is a two-way engagement that changes both the client and the counselor. If counselors are not sensitively tuned to their own qualities of tenderness, toughness and compassion and to their reactions to the client, they become technicians. In a seminal article, Dialogue in Gestalt Theory and Therapy, Jacobs explore the role of the therapeutic relationship as a factor in healing and the extent to which the client counselor is the focus of therapy. She shows how Martin Buber's philosophy of dialogue, which involves a genuine and loving meeting, is congruent with Gestalt concepts of contact, awareness and the paradoxical theory of change. Jacobs asserts that a current trend in Gestalt practice is toward greater emphasis on the client-therapist relationship rather than on techniques divorced from the context of this encounter. She believes counselors who operate from this orientation establish a present-centered, non-judgmental dialogue that allows clients to deepen their awareness and to find contact with another person. The techniques that counselors employ evolve out of this process. Experiments should be aimed at awareness, not at simple solutions to a client's problem. Jacobs maintains that if therapists use experiments when they are frustrated with the client and want to change the person, they are misusing the experiments and will probably thwart then foster growth and change. Experiments in Gestalt Counseling The experiment is fundamental to modern Gestalt Counseling. Zinker sees therapy sessions as a series of experiments, which are the avenues for clients to learn experientially. What is learned from an experiment is a surprise to both the client and counsellor. Gestalt experiments are a creative adventure and a way in which clients can express themselves behaviorally. Experiments are spontaneous, one of kind and relevant to particular moment and a particular development of a figure formation process. They are not designed to achieve a particular goal, but occur in the context of a moment-to-moment -moment contacting process between counsellor and client. Polster indicates that experiments are designed by the counsellor and evolve from the theme already developing through therapeutic engagement, such as the client's reports of needs, dreams, fantasies and body awareness. Yontev states that experimentation is an attitude inherent in all Gaston counselling and is a collaborative process with full participation of the client. Miriam Polster says that an experiment is a way to bring out some kind of internal conflict by making this struggle an actual process. It is aimed at facilitating a client's ability to work through the stuck points of his her life. Experiments encourage spontaneity and inventiveness by bringing the possibilities for action directly into the counseling session. By dramatizing or playing out problem solutions or relationships in the relative safety of the counseling context, clients increase their range of flexibility of behavior. According to Polster, Gestalt experiments can take many forms. Imagining a threatening future encounter, setting up a dialogue between a client and some significant person in his her life, dramatizing the memory of a painful event, Reliving a particularly profound early experience in the present, assuming the identity of one's mother or father through role playing, focusing on gestures, posture, and other nonverbal signs of inner expression, or 
carrying on a dialogue between two conflicting aspects within the person. Through these experiments, clients actually experience the feelings associated with their conflicts. Experiments bring struggles to life by inviting clients to enact them in the present. It is crucial that experiments be tailored to each individual and used in a timely manner. They also need to be carried out in a context that offers a balance between support and risk. Sensitivity and careful attention on the counsellor's part is essential so that clients are neither blasted into experiences that are too threatening nor allowed to stay in safe but infertile territory. Preparing Clients for Gestalt Experiments It is important for counsellors to personally experience the power of gestalt experiments and to feel comfortable suggesting them to clients. It is also essential that counsellors establish a relationship with their clients so that the clients will feel trusting enough to participate in the learning that can result from gestalt experiments. Clients will get more from gestalt experiments if they are oriented and prepared for them. Through a trusting relationship with the counsellor, clients are likely to recognize their resistance and allow themselves to participate in these experiments. The following guidelines have been suggested. It is important for the counsellor to be sensitive enough to know when to leave the client alone. To derive maximum benefit from gestalt experiments, the counsellor must be sensitive to introducing them at the right time. The nature of the experiment depends on the individual's problem, what the person is experiencing and the life experiences that both the client and the counsellor bring to the session. Experiments require the client's active role in self-exploration. Gestalt experiments work best when the counsellor is respectful of the client's cultural background and is in good contact with the person. If the counsellor meets with hesitation, it is a good idea to explore its meaning for the client. It is important that the counsellor be flexible in using techniques, paying particular attention to how the client is responding. The counsellor should be ready to scale down tasks so that the client has a good chance to succeed in his her efforts. It is not helpful to suggest experiments that are too advanced for a client. The counsellor should learn which experiments can best be practiced in the session itself and which can best be performed outside. The internal dialogue exercise. One goal of Gestalt counseling is to bring about integrated functioning and acceptance of aspects of one's personality that have been disowned and denied. Gestalt therapists pay close attention to splits in personality function. A main division is between the top dog and the underdog and counseling often focuses on the war between the two. The top dog is righteous, authoritarian, moralistic, demanding, bossy and manipulative. This is the critical parent that badgers with shoulds and oughts and manipulates with threats of catastrophe. The underdog manipulates by playing the role of victim, by being defensive, apologetic, helpless and weak and by feigning powerlessness. This is the passive side the one without responsibility and the one that finds excuses. The top dog and the underdog are engaged in a constant struggle for control. The struggle helps to explain why one's resolutions and promises often go unfulfilled and why one's procrastination persists. The tyrannical top dog demands that one be thus and so, whereas the underdog definitely plays the role of disobedient child. As a result of this struggle for control, the individual becomes fragmented into controller and controlled. The civil war between the two sides continues, with both sides fighting for their existence. The conflict between the two opposing poles in the personality is rooted in the mechanism of introjection, which involves incorporating aspects of others, usually parents into one's ego system. It is essential that clients become aware of their introjects. The empty chair technique is one way of getting the client to externalize the introject, a technique 
pearls used a great deal. Using two chairs, the counselor asks the client to sit in one chair and be the top dog and then shift to the other chair and become the underdog. The dialogue can continue between both sides of the client. Essentially, this is a role playing technique in which all the parts are played by the client. In this way, the introjects can surface and the client can experience the conflict more fully. The conflict can be resolved by the client's acceptance and integration of both sides. This exercise helps clients get in touch with a feeling or a side of themselves that they may be denying, rather than merely talking about a conflicted feeling. Clients realize that the feeling is a very real part of themselves. The intervention discourages them from disassociating the feeling. The goal of this exercise is to promote a higher level of integration between the polarities and conflicts that exist in everyone. The aim is not to rid oneself of certain traits, but to learn to accept and live with the polarities. Many common conflicts lend themselves to the game of dialogue. Making the rounds involves asking a person in a group to go up to others in the group and either speak to or do something with each person. The purpose is to confront, to risk, to disclose the self, to experiment with new behavior and to grow and change. The counselor might counter with, are you willing to do something right now to get yourself more invested and to begin to work on gaining trust and self-confidence? If the client answers affirmatively, the counselor's suggestion could well be, go around to each person and finish this sentence, I don't trust you because... Some other examples that may be appropriate for the making the rounds intervention are reflected in clients' comments such as these, I would like to reach out to people more often. Nobody in here seems to care very much. It's hard for me to accept good stuff. I always discount good things people say to me. It's hard for me to say negative things to people. I always want to be nice. The reversal technique. Certain behaviors often represent reversals of underlying or latent impulses. Thus, the counselor could ask the client who claims to suffer from severe inhibitions and excessive timidity to play the role of an exhibitionist. The theory underlying the reversal technique is that clients take the plunge into the very thing that is fraught with anxiety and make contact with those parts of themselves that have been submerged and denied. This technique can help clients begin to accept certain personal attributes that they have tried to deny. The rehearsal exercise. Often we get stuck rehearsing silently to ourselves so that we'll gain acceptance. When it comes to performance, we experience stage fright or anxiety because we fear that we will not play our role well. Internal rehearsal consumes much energy and frequently inhibits our spontaneity and willingness to experiment with new behavior. When clients share their rehearsals out loud with the counselor, they become more aware of the many preparatory means they use in bolstering their social roles. They also become increasingly aware of how they try to meet the expectations of others, of the degree to which they want to be approved, accepted and liked, and of the extent to which they go to attain acceptance. The exaggeration exercise. One aim of Gestalt counseling is for clients to become more aware of the subtle signs and cues they are sending through body language. Movements, postures and gestures may communicate significant meanings, yet the cues may be incomplete. In this exercise, the client is asked to exaggerate the movement or gesture repeatedly, which usually intensifies the feeling attached to the behavior and makes the inner meaning clearer. Some examples are trembling, slouched posture and bent shoulders, clenched fists, tight frowning, facial grimacing, crossed arms, etc. Staying with the feeling. At key moments, when clients refer to a feeling or a mood that is unpleasant and from which they have a great urge to flee, the counselor may urge the clients 
to stay with their feeling. The counsellor may encourage them to go deeper into feeling or behaviour they wish to avoid. Facing, confronting and experiencing feelings not only takes courage but also is a mark of a willingness to endure the pain necessary for unblocking and making way for new levels of growth. Dream work. The Gestalt approach does not interpret and analyze dream. Instead, the intent is to bring dreams back to life and relive them as though they were happening now. The dream is acted out in the present and the dreamer becomes a part of his her dreams. The suggested format for working with dreams includes making a list of all the details of the dream, remembering each person, event and word in it and then becoming each of these parts by transforming oneself, acting as fully as possible and inventing dialogue. Each part of the dream is assumed to be a projection of the self and the client creates scripts for encounters between the various characters or parts. All of the different parts of a dream are expressions of the client's own contradictory and inconsistent sides. And by engaging in a dialogue between these opposing sides, the client gradually becomes more aware of the range of his her own feelings. Two pearls, dreams are the royal road to integration. In this part of the module, you would be able to enhance your understanding of the chess doll chair work. It includes the following steps. Step 1. Ask the client if he or she wants to participate in the chair work. Step 2. Repeat the names of the two polarities that will be the focus of the work. Step 3. Ask which polarity is more present in the chair where the client is seated. Step 4. Encourage the client to make statements from the vantage point of one polarity to the other chair. Step 5. When the client is ready, suggest that the client move to the second chair and assume that polarity. Step 6. Remind the client of the statements made from the other seat. Ask for the feelings and a response. Step 7. Continue to suggest that the client move back and forth between the two seats as appropriate. Step 8. If the dialogue seems stuck, ask the client what he or she needs from the other polarity. Consider whether there is movement towards change. Step 9. If not, consider that for the moment the client has decided to retain the same feelings. And step 10. If change does occur, continue the two chair dialogue until the client has integrated the new insight and feelings. In this backdrop, the case begins as follows. A 37 year old woman has come to a counseling session because she is having difficulty accepting responsibilities for her failed marriage. She has been experiencing some anger and in this session begins to recognize that she might have some unfinished business left over from childhood. The counseling session begins with the client. I think I'm angry at my mother. It's silly because my mother died before my marriage fell apart. So what could I be bad at for her for? Would you like to explore that using the empty chair? Sure, I guess so. So you will be exploring the anger that you never expressed to your mother before she died. Which position feels more real for you where you are seated? Me. Me and my anger. Okay. Now imagine that your mother is sitting in the other chair. What would you like to tell her? Mom. I'm so mad at you for the way you've always cuddled Mark. You always yelled at me. I always got in trouble. Even when he did something wrong, you punished me for his bad behavior. It was so unfair. Okay, stay with that feeling. I just can't pass how unfair it was. Now that he is an adult, he has this sense of entitlement. He doesn't work. 
and dad has to support him. It just really makes me mad. You did both of us a disservice. It's not fair. Now that my husband is gone, I need support too. And where are you? Where is any help for me? Would you like to change chairs and respond from your mother's perspective? Your daughter is very angry at you. I know, honey, I'm sorry you are hurt and upset. But your brother was always so needy. It took him longer to do things. And you know how socially inept he was. I don't believe that I ever punished you for your brother's bad behavior. Switch chairs. Do you have a response to your mother? I sure do. Of course you knew. You made me hold his hand and walk around the yard smiling as if we were best of friends. I was so embarrassed when neighbors saw us. What were you thinking? Can you keep going with that? The client changes the chair, think for a moment from her mother's perspective, then responds thoughtfully. Maybe I hoped you would be a good influence on him. You were always so friendly and active. You were the cheerleader, the good student, the good daughter. I never had any problems with you. I hoped you would somehow influence your brother in a positive way. The client changes back to her own chair. Oh, I never thought of that before. I never looked at it from my mother's perspective. Stay in the role. The client begins to cry softly. I never realized how difficult it was for you, Mom. You had to raise us and Dad was always working. Then it seems as soon as I went to college, you got sick. And I never had a chance to know you as an adult. We never had time to have these conversations. It sounds like you're feeling very sad. It never occurred to me that my mother was frustrated too. What is it like for you to see your mother's frustration? It's like she's human. She had her issues too. And as a mother, I think, she tried to do the best that she could do. I just wish she had not died so young. I would really like to talk to her. Let us summarize what we have learned. The major contributions of Gestalt counseling may be summarized as Gestalt counseling is a holistic approach that values each aspect of the individual's experience equally. Therapists allow the figure formation process to guide them. They do not approach clients with a preconceived set of biases or a set of agenda. Instead, they place emphasis on what occurs at the boundary between the individual and the environment. Gestalt counseling operates with a unique notion about change. The counselor does not try to move the client anywhere. The main goal is to increase the client's awareness of what is. Instead of trying to make something happen, the counselor's role is that of assisting the client to increase awareness which will allow re-identification with the part of the self from which he she is alienated. Kistol counseling is a creative approach that utilizes experiments to move client from talk to action and experience. The focus is on growth and enhancement rather than being a system of techniques to treat disorders.